Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Dr. Jeffrey Squire, and I'm a faculty member in the Department of Social Science at York University, where I teach in the Urban Studies program. <clears throat> I'm also an affiliate at the City Institute, where I serve on the Executive Committee. On behalf of the City Institute, I welcome you to this evening's webinar. Before I begin, let me uh, uh, take some time to acknowledge our director, our interim director, Professor William Jenkins, and also our coordinator, Hazel Dizon, for the tremendous work they did in putting this together. This event is being held together by the Office of the Dean, was sponsored by the Office of Dean of Global and Community Engagement in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies, who offer financial support as well as the anti -black, uh, with the Anti-Black Racism Initiative Fund. We are also partnered with Black Urbanism Toronto in, in hosting this event. Long before today, as we gather here, there have been indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here and, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of, who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. In particular, we wish to acknowledge the ancestral traditional territories of the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, uh, whose territory we are gathering on today. We also recognize the contributions of the Metis, the Inuit, and other indigenous people who, are, who were here before us, both in shaping and strengthening this community in particular, and also our province and our country as a whole. As settlers, this recognition of the contributions and historic importance of indigenous populations, uh, indigenous people, must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our communities, and also to bring justice for murdered and missing indigenous women and girls across our country, as well as children who were victims of the residential school system. Since time immemorial, numerous indigenous nations and indigenous peoples have lived and passed through this territory. York University affirms our collective responsibility to honor the land as we honor and respect those who have gone before us, those who are here and those who have yet to come. We are grateful for the opportunity to be learning, working, and thriving on this land. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territories of many indigenous nations that this territory is subject to the dish with one spoon, one pound belt covenant, an agreement to share and care for the Great Lakes region. Folks, with that, now let me tell you a little bit about the City Institute. The Institute was established as an organized research unit at the, at the university in 2006. We are a community of affiliated professors, graduate students, senior undergraduate students, postdoctoral fellows, visiting scholars, and external partners who all share an interest in collaborative, interdisciplinary, and critical urban research. Our researchers are engaged in funded projects that examine issues of urbanization and gender in the global south, suburbanization in Canada and other parts of the world, the smart city phenomenon, and of course, research on several themes affecting Toronto and its region. Despite the interruptions caused by the COVID-19, we are carrying on with our research as best as we can and operating in a virtual capacity as with the rest of the university. During this unusual year that has affected all of our lives, the City Institute has organized and co-sponsored a number of events that have dealt with Toronto-related issues, such as the local effects of COVID-19, the crisis of affordable housing, and the question of community recovery in a post-pandemic world. You can find recordings of these events on our YouTube channel. This evening's we webinar, which will be recorded, continues our concerns around ethnic communities in Toronto. The emergence of what is currently known as Little Jamaica, located along Eglinton Avenue West in the city's midtown, speaks to the long history of immigration from the Caribbean to Canada, a history in which exclusions to entry founded on racial pre preference prevailed until the late 1960s. From then until today, Little Jamaica has become the center of Black Can Canadian economic, cultural, and social expression. The future of this unique neighborhood is now uncertain, however. The adverse impact of 10 years of LRT construction, coupled with the pandemic, have resulted in the displacement of community organizations and more than 100 businesses. Since 2018, Black Urbanism Toronto has worked to preserve and advance Little Jamaica's legacy as an African Caribbean district where Black entrepreneurship and community building is fostered. In October 2020, Toronto City Council adopted a motion supporting the novel creation of a Little Jamaica cultural district. But the scope of what a cultural district may present in terms of community empowerment remains to be seen. 
Our mission this evening, therefore, is to explore the potential that the designation of cultural district holds for a lot of Jamaica in socioeconomic, cultural, and legal context. And so we have assembled a panel of five speakers, including a contributor from California, who will be sharing their thoughts. We are also pleased that Toronto Councillor Josh Matlow, who introduced the cultural district motion to council, has agreed to join us as a respondent. And so at this point, it is my pleasure to introduce to you this evening's moderator, Mr. Royson James. Mr. James is a seasoned journalist with more than 38 years experience. He's a Toronto Star's urban affairs columnist recognized throughout the region for his steadfast reporting on the region's government and on social justice. Starting as a reporter covering municipal politics in Scarborough, North York and Toronto before amalgamation, Mr. James was the Toronto Star City Hall Bureau Chief and an editorial mem board member before becoming the mun municipal affairs columnist in 1998. Currently, he also has co-hosting duties on G98.7 FM and an instructor in the Dollar Learner Fellowship in Global Journalism at the University of Toronto. Mr. James is a native of Jamaica who immigrated to Canada in 1969, attended Hubbard Collegiate in downtown Toronto, and had his journalistic training at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. In 2004, he was named an honored alumnus of Andrews University. In 2013, he received Canada's Premier Award for African Canadians, the Harry Jerome Award for Media. In 2014, he was a finalist in the National Newspaper Award for Colonists of a Canadian Newspaper. Friends and colleagues, I present to you Mr. Roy St. James. Good evening, everyone. Um, just happy to be here. Um, my, I mean, uh, Professor Squire made me sound really, 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 really old, you know, 38 years of uh, <laughs> municipal politics. Um, but I, I guess it's a great pleasure to be here, to be in the presence of all you wonderful folk who have been contemplating and thinking about and designing in your head and knocking it around, you know, the, the future of little Jamaica. And um, tonight, we will be um, envisioning Toronto's Little Jamaica Cultural District, the prospects and the challenges. As with any good thing, there are prospects and challenges. And so we're gonna explore that tonight. Um, first, we will have um, the five panelists who will give us their presentation. And then our counselor, Josh Matlow will respond. Um, after that, we will have a Q&A period, so um, get all your questions ready. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll stay here all night and answer your questions, okay? So if you have questions, please get them all prepared so that we can get going on this. Um, again, our, our panelists, we're, we're fortunate to have Cheryl Case, who practices human rights approach to community planning. Um, and she is the founder of CP Planning, a nonprofit firm. And she's been leading Toronto wide grassroots consultation, which is absolutely important for this project. So we're looking forward to hear her, um, her concepts and her views. And we have Alika Hall, who has been um, working at the intersection of art, communications, and community development for the past 10 years. You know, art communications, community development, that's exactly what we need in Little Jamaica. So um, we're looking forward to her. She's also the executive director of the NIA Center for the Arts, um, just down the road there in Oakwood. So we're looking forward to that as well. Then we'll have Rosemary Powell, who is um, a passionate advocate for social, economic, and environmental justice. I mean, wow, that, you know, that's, that's the nexus we need for, um, for Little Jamaica. So that will be good. And so we'll be looking forward to hearing the executive director of the C Toronto Community Benefit Network, Rosemary Powell. Then we'll hear from Carolyn Johnson, who's the CEO of Black Cultural Zone Community Development Corporation. And she is all the way from California. So, hey, we're looking forward to hearing how the world looks um, from California, and I'm sure she'll have some great insights to share with us. And Kofi Hope, who is the 
co-founder of CEO Mac Monumental. I mean, Kofi is a Rhodes Scholar, so you know at least he's he's gonna lift the the uh, the tenor of um, tonight's meeting, and um, we're we're looking forward to hearing from you, sir. And finally, we will hear from, of course, the City Councilor for Toronto Saint Paul, Josh Matlow, um, the Councilor for Ward Twelve. Okay, so. Let's, um, why don't we start off with um, Cheryl Case. As I said, she is the co-founder, she's the founder of CP Planning, a nonprofit planning firm that applies artistic and creative methods to build bridges between stakeholders and communicate public interest as it relates to city building. Her work is, has, her work has included leading a Toronto-wide grassroots led consultation series on housing as a human right, as well as working with the local folks on Eglinton Avenue West neighborhood. She's a proud author and editor of House Divided, How the Missing Middle Will Solve Toronto's Affordable Housing Crisis. Sounds like one of my columns um, <laughs> writing about this. It's a collection of essays shortlisted for the Legislative Assembly of Ontario's 2020 Speakers Book Award. She served as a member of City of Toronto's Expert Advisory Committee on the 2020 to 2030 Affordable Housing Plan and is currently a co-chair of the Balanced Supply of Housing of the Canadian Housing Evidence Collaborative. She's a member of the ULI Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee and an adjunct professor at University of Waterloo's School of Architecture. She graduated from Ryerson University's Bachelor of Urban Planning program in 2017. So please, let's listen to Cheryl Case as she leads off for us tonight. Thank you so much, Franklin. Um, so yeah, so CP Planning is community in public and we specialize in planning with the public for the public, and this is all from the lens of human rights. And it's really important, um, this lens of human rights, as we are in the decade of the International Decade for People of African Descent, a decade put forward by the United Nations in acknowledgement of the specific challenges that have um, that Black people experience due to systemic anti-Black racism that is just pervasive throughout um, you know, our, our, our institutional structures. Um, so how does city planning implement this human rights approach to planning the public for the public? So um, this, uh, folks here might recognize this chart. This is uh, our uh, ladder of citizen participation. It's kind of a guide in terms of um, how much you engage the public, how much you trust the public, and then how much you empower the public to be a part of the decision-making process. And uh, from a human rights perspective, empowering marginalized groups to um, be a part of shaping the conversation is a really important component of um, a successful planning process. And this is what I've uh, been applying throughout my career and uh, leadership in CT planning. Um, and so I focus primarily on these top three rings, partnership, delegation of power, and citizen control. So when I did uh, Black Futures of Edmonton, a project I will describe later in the presentation, um, I would say that we really were able to settle on the partnership level of, of our relationship. This was, you know, um, as a growing organization, uh, um, this is this is where we, we we were able to do a lot of great work. Um, Block Urban in Toronto and Sweet Planning partnered, and we were negotiating what our interests were. We shared funding. Um, they were able to make requests in terms of what the priorities were, and I would say like some of some of the best outcomes actually came from the direction provided by. Black Ubers in Toronto. For example, um, Anika Mark, one of their members, was a great leader in terms of designing the artistic engagement approaches that we've applied. Um, and so in planning for the public with, with the public, we've actually moved forward to the citizen, citizen control component of this ladder, um, where we're actually in, in partnership developing grant applications, but then giving the power of ma maintaining the budget to the community partner. So um, for example, right now, one of the outcome of the Black Futures Edmonton project was this project called the Tenant Solidarity Project. Um, and in that project, I actually am working directly with the community members in Little Jamaica who have essentially hired me on uh, to implement the work. So 
that might be, I hope you were able to follow me along and I, as I described that, that, this will be coming back full circle near the end of the presentation. So Black Digital Mexican, um, as Rachel Jane described, an arts-based community cultural mapping study with views on Black culture in confront of anti-Black racism. So this is a study that um, Black urbanism and free planning were able to conduct thanks to funding by the, uh, the, Coast, the uh, Ministry of Heritage at the federal level. This fund itself was established thanks to decades of advocacy from Black Canadians and allies across the country. Um, really important to make note of that because um, the unfortunate thing is oftentimes things for the Black community don't quite happen until the Black community is able to make it known that their voices and their lives matter enough for um, these types of reparations to be made through direct funding to build our capacity to express our voice and to discover our voice um, and to have our voices to be heard. Um, one of the things that I found very interesting during the study is that a lot of the things that were uncovered in conversations actually have been going on. Uh, we've been expressing for quite some time um, the Black community having a trust and being able to stay in place. And, um, you know, the, this is the neighborhood where the study was focused in, uh, at least in Avenue West. So it's Allen to the east and Keel to the west. Um, and so this is an area where um, you'll see that between 2006 and 2016, the Black population has gone down by 13%, while the overall population has gone down 5%. This shows that Black population has actually been leaving a lot quicker than other populations. And why that is, um, here's a bit of a hint, perhaps, as to why. One of them is that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the cost of housing has gone up uh, significantly over this, this time. Um, and so when we're thinking about culture, being able to be in a place is really, really important. Um, I won't go into the, the, the details as I, I'm not sure if maybe the other presenters will be talking about the history, but the, 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 the Black community has been present in Little Jamaica for over 100 years. The first uh, Black business actually opened in um, 19, the, the early 1900s. Um, about 1910s or so, 1913 or so. Uh, you'll see a bit more detail about this in the Black Futures on Eglinton report, which I will link in the chat. Um, so over this time, while we're seeing uh, house prices going up, um, the city was doing their own study looking into how will the neighborhood respond in, uh, to the uh, Eglinton LRT that's coming along. Um, and you know, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, we are in a system that is uh, where anti-Black racism is our, a foundational element of the way that we do business. And um, it's unfortunate, but I think it's important to note that um, the, you'll notice in the uh, terms of what, what's been focused on, greening, building, and traveling, there's a lack of um, focusing on retaining small businesses, uh, uh, focusing on affordable housing. And these studies that were produced are incredibly important. Again, it is that missing element um, of uh, supporting community capacity to stay in place and to uh, develop their culture as um, they see fit and reflects their interests. So uh, what is culture? According to Canada, cultural processes uh, and cultural objects are the two components of culture. So cultural processes, this is our expressions, behaviors, traditions, relationships, and stories of the people or community. So as Black people, we all share a common ancestry of coming from Africa and um, depending on whether or not you are one of the uh, Black residents who you know, have a relationship to Africa, but through the Caribbean, or maybe you are an, uh, a Black resident who came directly to Canada from Africa, in many cases, you will still have a relationship with colonization and with um, the theft of your, your people's land and even your bodies um, from, uh, from your communities. And this has had um, long and deep lasting impacts on our community, uh, on, our, on our abilities to, um, to develop our own wealth, which is a really important component of culture. Um, so you'll see here the, the local businesses um, from Nathan and Goldie Redmond from the top uh, to the Black Barber to the bottom. Uh, business is a really important aspect of culture. And you, know, you think about events like the Caribana Festival, um, these things came together because people had the, fin the financial capacity to invest in, in these cultural expressions of their, of their um, communities. And um, of course, we have the artistic expression as, as uh, illustrated here, 
was to picture um, of three artists there in um, at one of the events that were hosted as part of the Black Pictures on Eglinton study. Um, so cultural processes and cultural objects are, you know, would be those events and those community organizations that allow us to develop our culture. So uh, comparing and contrasting what the traditional systems have focused on when it comes to um, developing relationship with land, a really important component of culture. You'll see they, if you compare and contrast some of the things that are focused on by community and by the Black community when they look at what is important to them. Black Urban in Toronto, a group that um, sprung together uh, just a, a couple of years ago, um, they've been focusing on protecting Black businesses. And that's because they know that Black, that, like, black people being able to have their own businesses is, is really important to allowing our, our, our communities to um, have the financial independence and capacity to invest in our communities, to invest in our families, and to enjoy the luxuries that um, you may outwardly see as culture, like for example, dance and, um, and art. Um, and then we also have the Black Business Grants for Toronto Edmonton West, as well as Reclaim Edmonton West. Uh, Reclaim Rebuild Edmonton West has launched their own uh, ten tenant support fund to support Black residents being able to afford their rent. It's another component of culture, this relationship between person to person. Uh, Mia Center for the Arts building their um, art community center, and as well as TCBN and that's all the amazing work that they do in, again, supporting the, the, the um, economic capacity for Black residents to, um, to grow and to stay in place by having the finances to be able to afford the rent that is going up. Um, as many of us may know, Black residents are often paid a lot less than uh, white or other racialized residents. And also it's really important to note that in these industries, for example, the construction industry, um, is ex extremely uh, unwelcome at, in most times to uh, black residents. And that's something that Rosemary can speak a lot more to, but, and also we have the tenant policy program that I um, mentioned earlier. And this is in partnership with the OCO, the Oakwood Bonds Community Organization, um, so thinking about cultural processes, so the, the Black Futures of Edmonton report took place over about a year and a half, and we had a number of amazing events, including uh, reggae night. We also had, um, you know, meetings in the library, and we had poem opens, and I'll be actually be sharing a poem with you later in uh, this presentation. So what were the things that the committee members were telling me in terms of their what was important that they wanted to see for the future of Little Jamaica. The cultural processes that they um, said that were most important were investing in community relationships, strategic development and planning, investing in relationships with the city, supporting local black businesses, telling our stories, taking the streets, black community owned property, improving safety. Uh, cultural objects were street festivals, educational events, arts based events and installations, to protect heritage buildings and food festivals. Um, and so here are a couple of quotes that are taken directly from some of the respondents of the survey that was sent out as part of the study. So, you know, here's one that kind of summarizes the idea of investing in community relationships. Um, there was an Angolan woman between the age of 25 and 35 who said that more collaborative programming between art and cultural centers, advocacy groups, and local businesses. So if you imagine the building the community capacity to, again, develop their voice and to develop programming that reflects their interests was a really important thing that the community expressed was a core um, cultural process. Uh, strategic development and planning, supporting local Black businesses. Um, this is by not allowing gentrification to buy out everything that made this community the beautiful, diverse, and safe place it was just 10 years ago when I moved here. And then street festivals. And taking the streets. So, bringing back prominent cultural events to the community, i.e., Taste of Jamaica, Kitty Caravana, uh, Car uh, Caravana itself, or Jerk Fest. Um, I do note that um, uh, there is an article out now by Sharif Sh um, on, on, on bringing back um, Caravana to the neighborhood. Um, and so, thinking about culture again. It's that idea of listening to community, building their capacity to develop, the capacity to develop their voice, 
and that can be um, implemented through a number of ways. Um, just out of interest of time, I'm not going to show this poem itself, but I will be linking uh, the page where you can find it. This is an amazing poem by Shanice Francis called Stella and I, um, where she talks about being, uh, you know, jumping into the future and imagining the neighborhood as it, as it might be if this process that has led to the increasing of, of house prices continues. Um, so when we're talking about culture and culture of Little Jamaica, um, there is so much that can be considered. Um, the development of economic opportunity, the development of opportunities for artistic expression, and the opportunity for residents to be able to afford to live where they want to live or in the neighborhood where they oftentimes grown up and have family relationships. And so how do we achieve that? Well, I think it's important to note that we are in a decade again uh, for people of, of African descent. And the theme of this decade is recognition, justice, and development. Um, I think it's an amazing thing that the city of Toronto has gone forward to establish a, a multi-divisional team that is focused on achieving these goals. And um, they've actually established this as a, a legacy project in reflection of this decade. Um, and so, you know, what I ask, what I ask the city is how does the Little Jamaican Culture Study budgeting process design and implementation empower Black residents to establish their culture on their terms? I think it's very important to note um, the, the inclusion that this is the community defining it on their terms as opposed to the city defining these terms for themselves. Um, and so with that and my presentation. Great. Thank you very, very much, Cheryl. I mean, you, you seem to be the housing expert on this panel. So I would imagine that there are people who are watching this who are preparing questions off you to tell us how we can stave off the flight from Little Jamaica, right? And make sure that the housing costs are affordable enough so that there will be a resident population. Because I noticed in your presentation, you know, you said the population of the city, black population is down already 13%. And it has a lot to do with affordability. So we look forward to in the question and answer, maybe you giving us some tips on how we can stave, stave off the flight. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Alika Hall. She's been working at the intersection of art, communications, and community development for the past 10 years. Her curatorial practice is driven by a desire to explore identity and power. And as she said, to excavate lesser known stories, as well as a commitment to expand the visual narratives surrounding the Black experience. Now, Alika also works to build capacity and resilience in communities, and she, the communities that she's a part of. And in 2018, she took on the role of executive director of the NIA Center for the Arts. Um, as you saw in, um, in Cheryl's presentation, you know, you need um, art, you need, you need the foundational pieces um, to knit this little Jamaica together. And so, this NIA Center for the Arts will support and showcase arts from across the Afro diaspora. In her time at the center, she has launched her first residency program, curated the first Black Art Fair, and strengthened partnerships with schools and businesses to create greater visibility for artists. Alika is now heading up the renovation of the NIA Center's 14,000 square feet facility to create Canada's first professional space dedicated to Afro-diasporic art. This $7.5 million, um, $7 million capital project will create a multi-purpose performance space, artist studios, a digital media lab, a recording studio, event space, and gallery space. So let's welcome Alika Hall. We're just dying to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Ryzen, for that generous introduction. And you know, thank you everyone who's joining us here tonight. 
Um, and to everyone who organized, you know, this conversation, I think it's such an important part of the city building process because um, the challenges that are facing Little Jamaica are not new and they are also not limited to this neighborhood. So great conversation and, and Cheryl's made some um, amazing points that I'll uh, echo in my time. Um, as Royston mentioned, my name is Alika. I work with the Center for the Arts. Um, we're currently renovating our facility. It's at 524 Oakwood, so just one block south of Eglinton West. Um, in a, and it's a former Toronto public health building. So we're sort of actively involved in the work of um, supporting culture in this neighborhood. We are a relatively new addition to the Eglinton Oakwood community. We've been around for the past 10 years, um, but more actively in Eglinton Oakwood for about the past four. Um, but we're really proud to build on a legacy of art and culture that's rooted in black artistic traditions that have shaped both this neighborhood and our city and our country for decades. Um, and before I get into that, I just wanna talk a bit about the role of arts more generally in community building and city planning. Uh, I think it's pretty widely understood at this point that art and culture is an integral part of city life in the post-industrial era. Not only are spaces and places of art in cities being redefined, we're seeing them um, definitely popping up as more and more part of the revitalization process, but art is also um, changing in how it relates to the urban environment. Um, it makes me think of one of my favorite quotes from what I call the Queen Mother, uh, American author Toni Morrison. Um, she says, quote in the book Jazz, and it goes, there is no air in the city, but there is breath. And it reminds me of the hustle and the bustle of what it means to sort of, you know, live and work in a city and the kind of also the loneliness that that cities can produce. Cities take a lot from the lands that they occupy and the people that they house and city living is not always easy. And I think it sometimes can produce stress that erupts in many forms, whether it's homelessness or isolation or mental illness. And um, the ways that we can sort of mitigate that or uh, intervene in those inevitable, um, what seem like inevitable consequences is through, you know, strengthening our social fabric, social connections, um, ensuring that there's arts and culture and services and programs in our communities to support, you know, community development, healthy identity in both the people and the residents and the city itself. Uh, here in Toronto, we see uh, across sort of the city, the investments in arts and culture are often connected to economic development. So I know Cheryl talked a bit about the definitions associated with culture. Um, and I think there's greater recognition from at least our local government, uh, as well as the federal government that um, culture and art really breed innovation across sectors. Like it doesn't matter if we're talking about STEM or music or architecture, um, where there's the presence of a lively, diverse artistic community, it helps to stimulate innovation in other sectors of the economy. And with creativity and innovation so closely tied to economic performance in the global marketplace, we see cities investing more and more in arts and culture as a real catalyst for development. We only need to look to some of today's world-class cities as strong, you know, they have really strong and artistic cultural centers. Of course, of course, what comes to mind is New York. Um, what is New York without Broadway or the Statue of Liberty? Um, this is a state that has the most galleries per capita in the world, really huge investments in the arts every year. And what has that generated for New York? Uh, you know, global brand, it's also given us, you know, the birth of the Harlem Renaissance, the birth of hip hop, certain forms of jazz, new fashion, like New York is truly this, this destination for art and culture and has been able to leverage those investments into huge economic development. Um, LA would be another great example of that. Um, the epicenter of film and TV, the home of Hollywood. Outside of North America, we have to acknowledge, well, first I'll acknowledge that I am half Jamaican, so as a disclaimer, but, um, we can't talk about the cultural influence of, um, you know, major cities and countries without mentioning Jamaica, which does have one of the smallest countries, one of the smallest countries by population in the world, almost 3 million residents, so roughly the same size as Toronto, um, but arguably would be in many people's top five in terms of cultural influence. Artists, musicians, tastemakers, cultural icons, so many are coming out of Jamaica. Um, and uh, folks that you might not even think of, academics, Marcus Garvey, Naomi Campbell, Stuart Hall, Miss Liu, the list goes on and on. If we travel to the continent and we think of uh, Lagos, Nigeria, 
put on the map for a number of reasons, a huge city, but we also have to acknowledge the role that literary giants played like Shinoa Ashibe and Shimamoda Adishie. Uh, the storytelling out of Nollywood very much contributed to propelling Nigeria onto the world stage. Arts and culture plays a vital role in establishing and maintaining aspects of sustainable communities. Places where residents take pride in where they live because of you know, either aesthetic investments in the public sphere or because of the ways in which art and culture fosters a sense of place and belonging, like you know, the New York brand and arguably the Toronto brand. I think in the past 10 years with the rise of the six, and we'll give some credit to Drake, um, we've seen a lot more uh, Torontonians really rep representing where they're from. And really that role of arts and culture can be to bring people together from diverse identities, experiences and interests, um, really contributing to social cohesion. More recently, I think we've seen um, more research looking at the role of art in cities in relation to gentrification. Um, and I think that, you know, that correlation really points to the power of artists to build communities and contribute to revitalization and regeneration. Um, artistic communities at the end of the day are all about questioning, provoking, um, bringing people together through that process of questioning and provoking. And so often, too often, at the end of these processes of regeneration, artists are priced out of the communities that they should, that they've helped to revitalize. And, um, you know, I think as we embark on a process of uh, examining how we support Little Jamaica, how we support cultural revitalization, we need to make sure that this is not a process that's, you know, connected to rebranding and focus more and focusing on, you know, improving the image of the place instead of the lives of its residents. Um, too often consultation processes are about helping people to accept what's ahead rather than change it. And I think we really have to be intentional about, as Cheryl mentioned, this be a self-determined process. So when we think about a cultural district and its function in a place like Ellen Eglinton, which is going through this massive transformation, we have to consider both how we preserve the past contributions that have shaped the area and ensure the future is viable and livable place for artists and cultural producers who play this vital role in, in pulling community together. So I've talked a bit about art can, how art can be an economic driver, um, but I also wanna to touch on what I think is the transformative part of the arts as a tool for us to understand ourselves and the world around us. Um, a little bit of an anecdotal story. When I first started in this role uh, with Nia Center, we were doing a launch event and I invited my dad to come down to the event. And he, he's more spatially oriented, like his brain works like a GPS. Um, so I just told him the address. He's like, yeah, I know that place, 524 Open. I'm like, you do? It's you know been a dormant health facility for 10 years. I'm wondering, you know, how does he know it? Um, and so he says, um, yeah, you work at a club. And I was like, okay, I see what you were doing in the eighties. Um, so the facility, uh, used to be a club that actually Farley Flex, if those of you have watched, um, um, Canada's Got Talent, uh, a judge on that show, he used to co-own with another community member. Uh, and it really reminded me of how, um, historically this neighborhood has been a way for African and Caribbean and black residents to stay connected to their culture and roots. And I think when we think about the value of a club, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem, you know, so, uh, relevant. Um, but you have to think about the time. Um, this is a time before Spotify, uh, before, before Tidal. And Black music wasn't regularly on the airwaves in Toronto until the 90s, right? With the launch of Flow 93.5, shout out to Denim Jolly. Um, so clubs were really a place for the community to come together, um, to listen to the latest music, connect them to their roots, um, to really engage in and preserve cultural traditions that they left behind um, in the islands that they're from. Uh, so a club was an extension of a community center, right? Um, before it was a community center, uh, or rather before it was a club uh, in the 70, 70s, um, the Nia Center building was uh, Isabella's Ballroom, which is an anecdote that I learned from Jay Douglas, who um, Cheryl mentioned uh, was doing it. They did a reggae night at, uh, at the center and Jay Douglas came uh, over to talk to us and said, you know, as soon as he walked in, he said, 
I used to play in this place, you know, Isabella's ballroom. It was, uh, we used to have all the Calypso and reggae acts. It was like the hot spot in the neighborhood. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about being in this facility is that so often community members who not, don't necessarily live in the neighborhood anymore or do um, walk in and, and have an immediate connection to the building. They have a memory and that memory is an important part of their, you know, uh, their growth and their trajectory in Toronto. And you get the sense that Eglinton was and is a destination for Black community, um, community members to connect with each other, um, to feel connected to this place that for so often and for so many of them in their workplaces and, and other aspects of their life, they didn't feel like they um, were included or connected. Uh, and so, you know, Eglinton was a way of coming back to a place that felt like home. And uh, that's echoed, you know, for many family members, uh, folks have talked about how uh, the um, food and grocery stores in Eglinton were a way to get, you know, dashing and yam and things that weren't available at Loblaws. Now, you know, no frills and Loblaws, they have these great, you know, ethnic aisles. Um, but before that, those foods were um, uh, you know, available, you have to go to Eglinton if you wanted to get certain produce and food stuff that were key to your, um, your cuisine on, on a Sunday. So Eglinton was a destination for food. It was a destination for fashion, it was a destination for news, right? Share a newspaper, um, a foundational paper that's been around for over, I think, 50 years, um, also based in the Eglinton Oakwood neighborhood. And of course, Eglinton is a destination for music, right? Um, so many musicians and, uh, artists have played in this neighborhood and have shaped that sense of belonging uh, for many uh, waves and generations of, of immigrants from the Caribbean. Uh, and in a time of, you know, this kind of rapid transformation where we're seeing this, this neighborhood change before our eyes, art is also a tool to document our history and to preserve it, right? I often remark when I go to museums that how much of you know, human history is left in those places, the artifacts, the materials, our stories are enshrined in the art that's been produced. Uh, and we've seen some success with starting to preserve um, the history of, of this um, you know, area that has um, gone on to influence the entire city. Um, you know, in 2014, a mural was painted by Adrian Hales at the corner of Eglinton and Oakwood. Um, and it is in now what is Reggae Lane. Um, this laneway celebrates the Caribbean music history that sprung out of Eglinton over the past 50 years. Um, and it was a project that was brought together through community collaborations, right? Um, our previous city councillor, Jay Douglas, is a local reggae artist. Uh, Adrian, of course, Arnold, uh, who's the editor of Share Magazine, and many others. And it was a really important moment for us to focus on capturing you know, these contributions that we know are not gonna make it to the history books, right? Um, you know, reggae, uh, again, is a black artistic tradition that's underrepresented um, in terms of how it's funded, in terms of how it's recognized in our city. Um, an example would be the Junos, right? It took the advocacy of Denise, um, Denise Jones, who was the co-founder of Jambana Festival, to advocate for years to say the Junos need to recognize reggae as a, a category. We have Canadians here who are producing reggae music, who are contributing to both the local and international scene, who aren't able to be recognized at our national award show. Uh, and so through her advocacy, the reggae category was finally added. Does it make it to the airwaves? Not always. But that's, again, an important part of, you know, the work that Black artists and, and, and um, creative entrepreneurs are doing to make sure that our artistic traditions are recognized by the existing Canadian institutions and mainstream arts sector, um, which has been a huge gap. And that I'm unmuted now, right? You can hear me? Okay. Thank you, Alika. Um, yeah, you're the type of curator I need, right? <laughs> you're you're going to keep us well informed and um, into the future as to what's happened um, in Little Jamaica and what will happen as we bring a transformative lens um, to this area. So now we'll go to um, Rosemary Powell. Rosemary is a passionate advocate for social, economic, and environmental justice for 20 years, Rosemary. Wow. From the grassroots up, you've managed and developed several innovative and impactful community programs and services to support historically disadvantaged communities and groups that are seeking, seeking equity 
and access to labor markets and the economy. Uh, we think of your community engagement work in Jane Finch, which earned you several awards for leadership and imagination. Currently, you're the executive director of the Toronto Community Benefits mm -hmm. Network, is a nonprofit community labor coalition representing over 120 member community organizations and groups. Um, Rosemary built on TCBN's initial success in negotiating Ontario's first community benefits framework for the Eglinton Cross Town LRT and led, co and led the coalition through subsequent campaigns to secure benefits for Finch West LRT, West Humber Healthcare Center, and the Rexdale Woodbine Casino expansion. So obviously, whatever you do in one place, you can actually move it over to the next one. So now um, you're going to turn your attention, obviously, to Little Jamaica. And uh, we look forward to that. In the process, you've built strong partnerships with community, labor, government, and industry partners to address systemic barriers and increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in the construction industry. Rosemary, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, Royson, thank you very much for the introduction. And yes, at the core um, of my, at, at, at my core, I'm a community organizer. And this is what I hope to bring to the space uh, today. Um, so uh, I'm sure we're all happy about the ending of the COVID-19 lockdown, right? But uh, there's something about it that really frustrates me. And it is our return to gridlock. <laughs> Anyone driving to work pre-pandemic, you understand that transit expansion in Toronto has been much needed and anticipated for decades. This has been planning for a long time. A plan was formalized in 2007 by the former mayor who announced Transit City. And the, at the time I worked with the Jane and Finch Community and Family Center and in, in the community, I remember a lot of conversations that were happening then about how this plan would uh, help residents to get where they need to be each day by helping to reduce travel times, improve access to workplaces, schools and other destinations throughout the greater Toronto area. But that wasn't the only thing that residents cared about. They wanted to know how would this project, this taxpayer funded project, would generate jobs and opportunities for this historically disadvantaged communities and the residents who live there. Now, when the uh, political winds changed, the responsibility for building regional transit was transferred uh, to Metrolinx. And construction of the first phase of the Eglinton Crosstown LRT began in, 2000, in, in 2011. This 19 kilometer line has 25 stops along Eglinton Avenue, starting from Mount Dennis Station, underground to Laird and above ground to Kennedy Station. Now this um, LRT passes through at least 12 different neighborhood improvement areas. Um, neighborhoods that the city of Toronto and United Way had identified as um, needing significant investment because the people living in those communities had been dealing with a lot of issues around poverty and unemployment and just really uh, challenges with uh, that stemmed a lot from bad planning. Now, this was the catalyst that caused the community at the time to mobilize and to form an alliance with labor to intervene in the decision-making process. And, um, you know, the thinking was, how can we ensure that this massive investment of taxpayer dollars would benefit the local community? How can we prevent gentrification? That was a huge concern that was happening. And this is really how our organization was formed. And we now have built a coalition of over 120 member organizations and groups from across the city of Toronto who are really grounded in the concepts of community benefits and how we can use that process to intervene in the decision-making process. As a community labor coalition, we fought and we won a community benefits agreement on the Eglinton Crosstown project, which was our first initiative uh, back in 2014. But it didn't come without compromises, unfortunately. It was our first time 
um, you know, um, uh, doing this. We did get a 10% construction hiring on the project. We got Metrolinks to preserve the Kodak land building. We got a commitment to social enterprise and local purchasing, but we didn't put in any real efforts into ensuring that the little Jamaica community was supported. We had the sense at the time that the local BIA would take care of the needs of the local businesses with respect to any land use or remediation needs that the local businesses needed. We didn't anticipate the devastation that this development would cause on Little Jamaica. And this project, after this project is complete, very few businesses will be able to afford to continue to operate in this neighborhood. We're learning that at least 10% of the businesses in that community has already closed down. And if we don't intervene now, we're gonna be in a real situation. And it's really good to see that, um, you know, here we are coalesced to really discuss what we can do as a community and with the relevant governmental leadership and even with the industry who's actually doing this uh, development work to make sure that little Jamaica doesn't get left out. It really isn't too late. There are lots of community groups across the city who are organizing in this very way. And little Jamaica can do it as well. When we think about the Jane and Finch community that I started at, um, out my conversation with, they had fought early in 2014 when the Finch West LRT project was um, being planned. And um, they fought for a land transfer to build a local a community hub for their use. And unfortunately, right in the middle of a pandemic in 2020, the government, uh, Metrolinx, basically came back and said they weren't going to honor that commitment. But the Jane and Finch community rose up, they mobilized, and they won. This community land transfer is going to happen. Metrolinx has transferred it to the city and the city will transfer it to the community and the community will build their hub. The RPNA, the Region Park Neighborhood Association, Community Benefits Coalition, they signed a community benefits framework with the Toronto Community Housing for the phase four, phase five redevelopment in Region Park, which included um, uh, yeah, a commitment to, to jobs and opportunities for the local residents. And they're looking also at social procurement. The Community Solidarity Against Racism in Construction launched a community response to the nooses found on construction sites in Toronto. They mounted a petition urging the government of Canada to take action. This work led to the city, the industry, the unions coming together and creating a declaration. A declaration that makes it clear that anti-Black racism and systemic racism is not welcome on the job site. Community has to stand up and make a demand. Otherwise, we will not be able to move forward. The foundation of the Afro-Canadian Contractors Association was a wonderful first step again in 2020 that basically um, happened because construction companies that were building this project said they couldn't find black contractors to give contracts to, right? And the reason and what they've done is they've come together and they have coordinated and now they're building capacity and they're going to be able to compete once they are strong and ready for these contracts on the projects. The Carpenters Union is making changes. Many unions are making changes to include diversity within their workforce. We can push to ensure that this happens through the community benefits process. We have other examples in Lawrence Heights. There's a revitalization coalition. In Scarborough, there's a community benefits coalition. In Mount Dennis, they're starting an equal neighborhood initiative to make sure that there is zero, zero um, uh, carbon, um, uh, net zero carbon in their community. We got Create TO and Housing Now to make sure that the housing projects that they're built is gonna include community benefits. 
the Golden Mile redevelopment is going to have a community benefit. There's a coalition that has started. And just um, during the middle of the pandemic, TCBN and our coalition, we mounted a campaign called the Inclusive Recovery Campaign across Canada, pressing the federal government to make sure that they include community benefits agreements on the funds that they're transferring to the province and to the city to build infrastructure. And so I'm telling us all of this right now because there is an opportunity for us as community to really stand up and use the process of community benefits to actually advance your community needs. And you know what? Little Jamaica is high up on the priority list for TCBN, for our Community Labor Coalition. We did a polling of our membership and Little Jamaica ranked second within our membership in terms of the, the, the interest that our community and labor partners have in coming together to do something to ensure that Little Jamaica will not only survive, but will thrive throughout all of this. What I'm trying to say is that it's not late. And there is more investment that is coming from the federal government and from the provincial government and from the city of Toronto for these transit projects. And so it is incumbent upon them to carve out benefits that are going to uh, support the equity, diversity, and inclusion of all peoples, especially the Black community who has on whose backs we have been building these, um, uh, the Eglinton Crossdown project. There's an extension that is being planned with another, um, the, the $12 billion that the government of Canada just invested for the extension of the Eglinton Crossdown to the east and to the west and the Ontario line, more money is being invested. How can we ensure that we demand better, that we demand better outcomes from these infrastructure investments. And this is what the TCBN is here um, you know, to, to assist with. And uh, this is why myself personally, I've been participating in the community consultation process that um, the Black Urbanism Toronto and CP Planning and the BBPA and the, the Mayor's Roundtable has been doing over the last um, year or so. And uh, I know that it's not too late. We can definitely do something about it. And this 120 member strong, mighty coalition is behind this effort. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, it, it's, it's good to hear that it's not too late, right? And, and man, you just listed off all the various communities that are really um, getting smart and figuring out how to access and hook into the, the, the benefits and the opportunities that we have in the city. And I'm sure that you will be available to help the community. You know the buttons to push. And so all we got to do is hook up with you, right? And you'll, you'll show us the blueprint <laughs> on, on how to do this. And well, we're ready to we're ready to roll up our sleeves and to work with the community. So let's do this. Perfect, perfect. And you know, anything I can do to help, um, give me a call. All right. So now we go to Carolyn Johnson, CEO of Black Cultural Zone Community Development Corporation. It's a California nonprofit founded in 2019. The purpose is to innovate, incubate, inform, and elevate community-driven projects that allow the Black community to thrive and prosper. Its work benefits the larger Oakland community, particularly those most at risk of displacement, including residents and businesses, entrepreneurs, organizations, and artists. Now, the Black Cultural Zone CDC is part of the East Oakland Black Cultural Zone Collaborative which since 2014 has worked with coalition of residents and governments and agencies and churches and grassroots organizations and community groups to address the impact of decades of disinvestment in East Oakland. Through its strategy of building power, securing land and directing more dollars to community-driven projects, 
They have helped keep black folks in East Oakland, right? That's better than, more successful than keeping the, Ra the Raiders, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry about that, one of my favorite teams. It proclaimed the East Oakland Black Cultural Zone as a 50 square blocks from High Street to San Leandro border and focused on implementing arts and cultural strategies and engaging artists and community members in art activism. I like the sound of that. Before being the CEO of Black Cultural Zone CDC, Carolyn was director of commercial real estate at the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation, wow, which develops and manages high quality affordable apartments and homes, retail spaces for local small businesses and community centers, while fostering increased economic opportunities for low income families and individuals. A lot of experience there, and we're just looking forward for you to tell us how we might be able to transform some of that stuff over here to Toronto. Thank you very much, and let's welcome Carolyn Johnson. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and it is a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's just amazing as I sit here and listen to all that you're talking about in Little Jamaica, how very similar it is to what's happening in Oakland, in California, and all over the United States in legacy Black communities. It's almost as if it was meant to be. It was almost as if um, just the essence of being Black, we are um, subject to um, displacement and relocation in many ways. And so in Oakland, which is you know, a very um, important city in California, was one of the uh, majority Black cities for a very long time that it's no longer the case. Um, it's also home to a very strong Black power movement, the Black Panthers, the Black arts power movement. And so that's just in the soil as they call it here, it's in our culture. And so um, in 2014, um, we began to notice uh, the folks who started the Black Cultural Zone, just a decimation of the Black business presence along our major international boulevard corridor. The city of Oakland is about 250 blocks by 250 blocks. It's, it's uh, 400,000 residents approximately. And um, at that time, we, at the height of the Black presence in Oakland, there were a thousand Black businesses along this corridor, which ran the length of the city. And currently there are three. And so the decimation of the Black business presence is real. One of the best indicators in this country of the, the next step of displacement is a transportation project. And the city had proposed uh, what we call the bus rapid transit district, which significantly has displaced the last who were hanging on. And so in 2014, there was a group of artists who said, you know, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to hold this place for black people, especially in this legacy city where we are truly the mojo in Oakland, black folks. Um, what can we do? We need a black cultural zone. We need a place where black people can hold space. We need something called cultural hubs. And so the concept was really to um, embed in the traditional community development work of building housing and some commercial real estate, unapologetically centering Black arts and culture and naming who we do the work for. So we call what we do not just community development, we call what we do cultural community and economic development. And so you, you mentioned our vision and, and mission, but I want to repeat it for you. Um, the Black Cultural, cultural Zone CDC um, our vision is for a robust and vibrant renaissance in legacy Black communities. When we say legacy, there are areas that at one point had a majority Black presence um, and no longer have that. So for instance, in East Oakland, the presence of Black folks, it was about 80%. All of Oakland, it was about 59%. There are many regions in Oakland. Oakland has a large West Oakland Black community where most folks who fled the South and Jim Crow came to uh, Oakland to work on the railroads. So there's a robust population. Another transportation project displaced most of the West Oakland residents. Many were moved to different places around California. Most were relocated near dumps. And then eventually East Oakland became a place where um, black folks were able to come back to Oakland. But our, our vision is that we will be robust. We will have a renaissance in our communities and our mission is to unapologetically center Black arts and culture and economics and the work that we do. It is great to have Black arts because arts really is our voice. It speaks for us, it speaks for our culture, but without economics, we can't truly hold place. Um, our leadership, 
really is a range of folks. It includes commercial real estate experts. It includes finance experts. It includes legal experts, engaged community engagement experts, economic development and arts and culture. We find that we have had to bring very different pockets of people together to all say the one same thing. We are going to hold place here in Oakland. So our challenges are very similar to what I've heard you all talking about. Um, in Oakland, for example, the life expectancy in the flatlands, which is where most black people live, not all, of East Oakland is on average 12 years less than the predominantly white, white East Oakland Hills. And for many reasons, we can sum up all of the impact of sort of the racism and discrimination and how it affects our lives. And so there is a 12 year difference. And subsequently, Oakland, East Oakland is now in the crosshairs of Bay Area gentrification. Oakland is across from San Francisco in the middle of Silicon Valley near uh, many universities. And so it's a very high value location. Most whites fled in 1960 to move to the suburbs and have rediscovered Oakland that they left. It's a great place. It's got great weather. It's near the airport. It's near water. We have beaches. We can get to the mountains for snow. Great location and we're being gentrified out. So those are the challenges that we're facing here in Oakland, California and many legacy black communities all over the United States. And it sounds like in Canada as well. So one of the things that we've done and we know it's really important that there are many, many groups out there. And our strategy is that we have to unite. We have to find a common agenda. We have to have a common ask. We may have a range of options of ideas in our black community. We are not a monolith, but there have to be some things that we agree on. And we all agree that we want to hold place for black people and black business in Oakland. And so the black East Oakland Black Cultural Zone Collaborative actually is what started first. Um, we organized uh, many different groups. We now have 30 plus black led organizations who are partners. We meet regularly and I'll talk more about that around that vision, that one vision that we can agree on of a renaissance in our community. We have 20 plus non-Black led allies and supporters. And we have a legacy of true community engagement where we go block by block, door by door. We are folks who are from the community. I personally was born and raised in East Oakland. It's really important to have people who are involved in these conversations, be folks who are from there. And those who are not understand, we appreciate your support. You are an ally here but you have to take a back seat. Um, so we let the community who really knows the community lead and direct and support. And we engage constantly. And that's a very important strategy. I'm sure you all do that. But if you're not constantly talking to the folks, the new folks, the old folks, the other folks, the folks who are interested, the folks who are developing, everybody's gotta be in the conversation so that you can stay on track. So we have other partnerships. In addition to our collaborative, we've had many foundations who come in and wanted to do something in certain neighborhoods. We brought, for instance, in East Oakland, building healthy communities. And so it's not necessarily focused on the black community, but our community now is flush with um, beautiful Latinx folks who have come from Central America and South America and really bringing the foundation community in. And uh, one of the things that we were able to do was develop something called the Healthy Development Guidelines, which the planning department has adopted, which basically requires that any new developments takes into consideration its displacement impact, its economic impact, your hiring, but really puts it in one place where projects can't necessarily go through without the sign off of the community. And we have guidelines around what would really cause gentrification. Um, we have created a special, uh, looked at creating a special community endowment to fund this work. When in the Bay Area, which is a very active real estate market, if you're not ready to buy properties that are available, you will lose out. And it may seem expensive, but I promise you, 10 years later, you will have wished you bought that corner store for $1 million. And so we need funding to be able to act quickly, to buy and hold, and then to plan what we're going to do to hold real estate. Another uh, important thing that we do is to convene various collaborative tables. There are many different groups. And here's a list of just a few groups that between all of these groups that I'm talking about, there's probably a hundred organizations that meet regularly around this one mission. And that's very important that we do that. Um, we have another group called the East Oakland Neighborhood Initiatives. Again, a different set of groups. You'll find that in Oakland, there's probably seven or eight different pockets of people with different ideas or some folks who wanna defund the police, for example, and some folks who want to, they love the police, but we can all agree that the police should not um, overemphasize and overharm black people. And so how do you bring folks together for agreement? 
one of the large grants that we just received from the state of California was something called Better Neighborhoods, Same Neighbors. And that's what we want. We want our neighborhoods to be improved, but we want the same neighbors to enjoy that improvement. We were able to get thir approximately $30 million to do several projects, community engagement, do anti-displacement work, and economic development work, another community partnership and engagement. So you'll see we really, what we're finding is that community engagement and collaboration is really the key. Um, but in terms of our cultural community and economic development, the Black Cultural Zone, the CDC, us, who I represent, our focus is on creating Black Cultural Zone hubs. So imagine a 30,000 square foot building that has a theater space in there that highlights Black movies, Black film, Black art, Black culture. There may be restaurants in there as well. Think of a market hall. Uh, we also believe that we'll have co-working space and outdoor space and really it will be the most important thing about these hubs is not what it does. A one-stop hub is not unique, but the fact that it will be owned by the community, that there will be community shares, there will be a Black community trust. And so that if these buildings were to fall in trouble 50 years from now or 100 years from now, Black folks will find a way to be able to keep it in the community. The other thing about the hub strategy is that where we put these great, exciting buildings, it will bring others who will see it's great and they'll look around and they'll want to buy a house. So this hub could actually further gentrify. So we have a strategy that in addition, five, 10 blocks around these hubs that we will develop, we have a residential real estate strategy as well to restore, retain and recruit black folks who are there to stay there and to come back there. And that's the strategy of identifying residential properties that may be available before they go to the market to see if we can support Black folks to be ready to be able to acquire. So we don't want to build a beautiful hub and gentrify ourselves out. We want to make sure that the housing around there also holds it. And we want to elevate East Oakland. We believe that our people are the beautiful canvas that makes Oakland. It's really important that everything that we do, we make sure that we're retaining the existing folks that we have, Black businesses and folks, that we restore them. Some folks are hanging on by a thread. How do we support them? And that we return those that have been displaced who left because they could not afford to be here. That is our core strategy. So an example of some of the hubs that we are developing, we have two in the process. One is a 54,000 square foot space that was owned uh, by the city's redevelopment agency. We were able to license it and bid on it. And we're hoping to hear positively that our plan to build a market hall to house black uh, retail businesses and restaurants and to create a media television and film center as well as a co-working space so it's important that we think about these hubs that we want to develop and we want to develop 10 in this 50 block radius that will each have a different niche. So this niche is around media, television and film. We believe it's important because what we're programmed to believe in media, television and film perpetuates these myths that leads to stereotypes and discrimination. And so we want to control our media and our television and our film with a center. Soul Beat is a, a television station that you wouldn't know about, but it was one of the first black owned television networks in this country before BET, TV One, there was Sobe. And it was started by a man named Chuck Johnson in Oakland. So our, our goal to preserve our history and to really move it in the future is evident in the kinds of hubs that we will develop. Another hub that we're working on is a property owned by the Oakland Unified School District, where we will have another black cultural zone hub that will focus on liberation education. And liberation education will focus on helping our folks who many are not aware of African and indigenous cultural education practices, which we believe leads to pride, cultural pride to know your history. We are unrooted in this country. We have been displaced from our original homeland and we're disconnected. But in order to really build black power, we have to understand who we are, who we were and what we can be. And again, Edward Shands, which is the name of the person that this center was named after, was an Oakland educator. And so we mix this preserving history looking for things that will build power with sort of an Afro-futuristic lens and we embed that in a hub. So how do we work? I said before that we have 30 partners. We have collaborative work groups. So we have partner meetings with all of these partners twice a month where we sit down and we talk about strategy. We have an annual retreat where we think about what we've done, where we're trying to go towards that goal. We look at data, we have consultants and we make plans. We then delegate those plans to four different kinds of groups. First is arts and culture. We're about preserving black arts and culture and also identifying a new black future. We also see arts and culture as our tool for conversations in our city around what is the truth? How do we reconcile the truth? What are the reparations that are due and how do we reimagine a new future? 
And with the murder of George Floyd here in America, um, some people have come to the truth that we have known for many decades and we're working across ethnic groups to identify how could it be that for the first time you realize that there was such violence against black bodies. We've known it all the time, not to disparage you, but to understand how you and I have very different worlds. But it's also important to say that there are reparations due. This country is stolen land. The people who built it are stolen people and reparations are owed. And all of this has to happen before we move to reimagine a new future. We have another group called Strong Economy. We look to reinvent Black Wall Streets. Uh, last month was the 100 year anniversary of Tulsa burning, a Black Wall Street that was destroyed and decimated in less than three days. Um, but we believe that to circulate dollars in the Black community, we have to build up our businesses and give Black folks options to buy what they need within their community, but also attract money from out, outside. We can't grow our economy um, if we continue to spend every dollar that we have outside of our community. And placekeeping is another work group that we have. It's not just about holding place, it's about knowing what happened there and acknowledging that and then protecting that. And then finally, quality of life. Many black neighborhoods are just in terrible condition. They're in conditions that are unacceptable for anyone to live in. And we insist and demand our right to safety, to peace, to love, to health, to wellness as anyone else. And so we organize lots of the sort of nonprofit service structure to really help us design a future and demand the resources we need to have quality communities. So we also have steering committees. So the collaborative is actually uh, set up a steering committee to say, how do we pull this work off? And we formed an entity. We formed the Black Cultural Zone, CDC. And we also form other social enterprises. Currently, we actually just launched an outdoor roller skating rink. Roller skating is very Black in Oakland and very black in the United States. We had three roller skating rinks at the height of the black presence in Oakland and they were all systematically taken away and we're bringing it back. But that is an enterprise, right? We're teaching our young folks and old folks, how do you run a roller skating rink? How do you run the snack shop? How do you run the skate repair shop? So they're learning skills while also accessing what was black culture. Um, finally, we work with many, many community groups, some of who I will name here. One is the Black Space Cooperative all of the groups that are out there trying to create black spaces have agreed that we will not recreate the exploitative and extractive model of capitalism, that there must be cooperative ownership of the tenants in that space, of the community in that space and of the workers. We don't wanna reinvent the model that enslaved us. We are also a part of a group called 40 by 40 that focus, focuses on a geographic area. And I note this because we include healthcare providers. We include a group called the Brotherhood of Elders who really hold on to male, black male traditions and pass it on in mentoring relationships. So it's a broad range. There is no typical group that's involved with this effort, except for the fact that you want to see a strong and thriving black community. Oakland Frontline Healers are groups who have folks who are out there on the streets working one-on-one -on -one to prevent violence and to promote healing. We also have a group called the California Black Developers. So across the state of California, we're having the same conversation with folks who are doing these projects in other places. We believe it's really important that these black cultural areas like what we have in Oakland and other places connect with groups like yours. There are groups in Seattle, Detroit, and your group, Canada and others I've met all over this country, all over the world who are doing the same work. And we need to talk to each other, identify shared strategies, have conversations and do the things that we all need to do collectively to build our black community around the world. So if you don't mind, I'm going to try and share a, a very short video, which talks a little bit about uh, the story. It's only two minutes. Um, it's called East Oakland Rising, uh, Win the Fight and Protect the Win. It highlights what we've been doing here um, in Oakland. So I will stop the share here and hope I do this correctly. And try it again. Yeah. So I can find it. Here we go. And I'm gonna play it for you guys. Hopefully you can hear it. It's a reason why we call it the hood, because we lost the neighbor aspect. East Oakland I grew up in, we knew our neighbors. Cracking the violence completely obliterated that trust. Predatory lending hit East Oakland, foreclosures hit East Oakland. 70% of unhoused folks are black people who lived really in East Oakland. I've seen the absolute systemic reduction of our ability to live. But it's like all of a sudden, Oakland became this place to be. 
and the rents began to double, triple, even quadruple. I think everyone's fear is that it's going to lead to even more erasure of what has historically been Oakland. Several years ago, my son Simarashi made a mistake that cost him and me dearly. Discrimination was taking place on a lot of levels, so we felt it was a need to step up to the plate. There's been a lot of victories, there's been a lot of wins. The entire city council agreed with us that this was an example of environmental racism. We have a right to have a good existence, to have homes, to have peace, to have place. When you raise up the issues of African Americans, you raise up the issues of all people. We have to always consider the human element of any policy we are working on. I had a meeting with the Berkeley City Council around the Fair Chance Housing Ordinance. What would it look like? To, to acquire land, to have a space and a place where people can live, where they can exist. The community comes together and builds relationships and builds power, like that was the ultimate goal. Oakland is not just an edgy slogan to wear on a t-shirt. For those of us who grew up here, it really means something. When we work together, we can do all kinds of things. It's gonna take us to save us. It's gonna take us to save us. Thank you. And that last lot that you saw is the uh, Film and Media Center, the 54,000 square foot space that we're looking to acquire from the city. Thank you so much. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. James. Oh, Carolyn, thank you so much. Uh, there's such hope there, all amidst the challenges, right? And um, boy, we can, we can see the parallels between there and um, little Jamaica. Uh, listen. Thank you for sharing that and um, sure hope that we can learn from each other. Kofi Hope, speaking of hope, <laughs> Kofi, the founder of, uh, co-founder of CEO, co-founder and CEO of Monumental, a business supporting an equitable recovery from COVID-19 by building fair and just institutions, profiling and amplifying BIPOC leaders, and launching creative, socially driven initiatives. Kofi is a Rhodes Scholar and has a doctorate in politics from Oxford University. Um, he's also an Emeritus Boosfield Scholar and currently an adjunct professor at the University of Toronto School of Geography and Planning. So there's a lot of learning in that head of yours, sir. <laughs> he serves as the senior fellow at the Wellesley Institute and writes a monthly column, well regarded and read column in the Toronto Star. He's a board member of the Atkinson Foundation and supports a number of organizations, including the Black North Initiative and Progress Toronto. In 2017, um, Kofi Hope was the winner of um, the Jane Jacobs Prize. And the following year was named a rising star in Toronto's life power list. In 2005, he established the Black Youth Coalition Against Violence and became a leading voice for advocating for real solutions to gun violence in Toronto. And that led him to being named by the Toronto Star as the, one of the top 10 people to watch in Toronto, that was 2006. We're still watching you and tonight we're gonna listen to you, sir. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you, Royce, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, it, it just feels so great to be here with these comrades in this work, Rosemary, Cheryl, Alika. Alika, you know, way back, as Royce had mentioned in 2005, we were working together in student organizing with the Black Youth Coalition Against Violence. And so it's an honor to share the stage with these incredible leaders. And of course, Royce and, you know, someone told me the other day that I was now their favorite writer in the star after Royce and of course. And so <laughs> that was a big compliment to get. And Carolyn, you know, thank you so much for this amazing vision from Oakland. You know, what a, what a great panel we have tonight. And I'm gonna admit this whole idea of a cultural district, it's, it's new to me. And from what I understand, it's, it's really a new concept to everyone in Toronto because it's the first time it's happened. And so, 
we have this credible opportunity to shape it. And tonight I'm gonna give a couple points around this topic. I'm gonna talk about why is Little Jamaica so important and what can we take from that as we think about its future. I wanna talk a little bit about what authentic community engagement needs to look like to shape this process and also some of the components for a local community economic development strategy. So, you know, first, you know, why is Little Jamaica or Eglinton West, as we call it, so important? And one of the things that is very, very imperative to think about in this most diverse city in the world is the importance of connection and representation. Right, And when we think about connection, they say in, in the literature, there's this idea called social capital, you know, the strength of, of networks and connections between people. And they talk about there being two parts of social capital, right? There's bonding, which is the connections you make within your community, and there's bridging, the connections you make to other communities from other backgrounds. And strong communities both bridge and bond. But so important to making those connections, both with your own people and other groups, is place. And we know that throughout history, you know, place has had a key role in building that social connection for Black Torontonians. If we look back at the past, there are really like two phases um, to the history of, of Black Toronto. The first was during the 1800s. And that was really a time when the story of Black Toronto was the story of African-Americans living here in exile of sorts. Uh, many of them living downtown in a neighborhood called The Ward, uh, which is right kind of to the west of City Hall today. And right where Osgood Hall is, and during some of that expansion, they discovered the remains of the African Methodist Church that was built there in 1845. And this church was not just core to people's spiritual life, but it was a major place for social connections and networks. It's where that social capital was built. And it was a hub for the abolitionist movement and so many connections of support in that black community in that first stage. And then we have our second stage, which really was from the 1950s onwards when immigration first from the Caribbean and then decades later more so from continental Africa brought new black communities to the city. And I, I wrote an article about Little Jamaica in February in the Star. And in it, I mentioned a man named Daniel Hill. And he wrote a thesis in 1960 on Black Torontonians. And he talks there about interviews he did over the 50s and this emerging West Indian Black community in the city. And the thing that came up time and time again in the interviews were how badly people wanted a cultural district, a place to call their own in the city. And soon after that, that aspiration was realized in Little Jamaica. But there were other hubs, right? Bathurst and Bloor was another key spot. And just like that African Methodist church before was a first stop for Americans when they arrived in Toronto to connect with their um, people and their community, Little Jamaica and these other cultural hubs like Bathurst and Bloor, they played that role for folks coming up from the Caribbean to this cold, very white, at the time, very culturally conservative place where they were making a life. And so parts of the city where we can have these hubs where people can see people who look like themselves and find support and build social capital are critical. But beyond being a place for connection and community building, psychologically, they're also critical. You know, I was born and raised in Canada, but many of us here either know or probably heard from our parents this concept that back home, whether that was Antigua or Jamaica or Ghana or Swaziland or Haiti, People didn't have the same constraints around this conception of black identity and what you could do. You know, my mom would always say, you know, back in Antigua, there was no concept of a black person can't do this since everyone was black, the lawyers, the doctors, the judges, the prime minister. And we know how important seeing those role models and representation is to people's development, especially in Western societies that have spent 400 years forwarding myths and lies about the inferiority of Black people. We know that without examples that you can see and touch of Black folks just, you know, killing it in life and society, of Black excellence on full display, then people are really open to stereotypes taking hold. Then lower expectations can infiltrate the minds of our young people. And, and this isn't just me saying it because I think it, we have evidence behind this now. There was a, a really massive study, it was released in 2018, uh, about African-Americans and social mobility. And scholars from Stanford and Harvard and the US Census Bureau teamed up. And they looked at, they tracked just men for it, but they looked at men from the 1930s to today using the census, 
So literally hundreds of millions of Americans, which is as exhaustive as you can get in social science. And they looked at social mobility, how people improved over time from the social position of their parents. And they found not surprisingly that white men across the study were much more likely than black men to improve their social position and much less likely to be in a worse social status or situation than their parents. But they found there were some parts of America where, where this trend didn't hold. And they looked at it and said, well, what's unique about these geographies? And what they found were these were neighborhoods where these young black boys grew up to be black men in communities that had the highest degree of black men, of black fathers present, who were you know, gainfully employed and doing positive things. And here's the kicker. It wasn't saying that these were neighborhoods where all of these young men had those fathers in their homes. It was just the fact that those men were present in community. As the authors said, what mattered was whether you might have you know, a black man as a teacher in your high school or as a local store owner you saw every day or a bus driver or a lawyer. That was the biggest single factor in whether there was a neighborhood where those young black men saw their financial and social situation improved in their lifetimes and didn't fall backwards. Now, obviously this study just looked at men, so it's not a complete picture. But what it shows with scientific accuracy is the importance of representation, of role models, of Black young men and women being able to see themselves in folks in positions of success and power in their community. And that is why Little Jamaica and communities like it are so important. They're places that young people can say, hey, this is a part of our city that my community owns where we are seeing success, where our stories are told, we have our food, our music, and our culture unapologetically on display. And I talked in my article about, you know, my own experience with one of those hubs, uh, which was much diminished by the time I showed up, but moving to uh, Toronto in 2002 to downtown, uh, going to Bathurst and Bloor, and it's a kind of a weekly ritual to get my hair cut, to go to a different book list and look at different uh, literature from across the diaspora. And, and that sense of connection it gave me. And then I remember sitting down for lunch with my uncle, Gervin Farron, um, close family friend, who's now coming back to Toronto as the first Black president of George Brown College. Uh, and I remember going out for lunch with him and telling him about uh, Bloor and Bathurst and him schooling me and saying, Kofi, I've been, I was going there 20, 30 years ago and doing the exact same thing, getting my hair cut, going to community meetings, looking at books, and what that felt for me to then feel that sense of connection to this place and to be part of a tradition of Black history in my own city. And this is becoming increasingly important for our community. You know, I remember going to high school in the GTA in the late 90s, and, and Black kids, my peers, no one was claiming Canada. People would say, no, nah, man, I'm Jamaican, I'm Trimley, I'm Somali. They claim anything else but Canada. And in my own lifetime, and especially working with young people, I've seen this shift. I've seen how third generation Black Canadians start to have a different identity. And, and what really brought it home for me was running the charity that I ran for many years uh, out of Jane and Finch and seeing a young man in 2013 come into my office and he had this new clothing line. And he's like, yo, Kof, check this out. I got a hoodie and look, here's a logo. And then bam the maple leaf right on the sleeve. And I just looked back at that and said, wow, things have changed. Because this young man, I would not describe him in any way as being connected to mainstream society in Canada, but for him doing an urban clothing line, adding that maple leaf, adding that Canadian part was essential. And, and I think this is part of this change that we've seen with so many other newcomer communities in Canada that at the third generation, those links to back home weaken groups really become connected to this place. They lose the mother tongue and, and, and they are in many ways part of Canadian society and mosaic. But the problem is we have a society that is still so hostile to black people. And actually, when you look at the results, uh, Professor Carl James from York, who I've worked with on a couple studies, his work has shown quite clearly that we actually see some of the worst social outcomes for third generation Black Canadians, much worse than first or second generation. And that kind of blows out of the water this racist garbage that people say when there's issues in our community, oh, there's something inferior about Black culture. And they've been importing their issues to Canada. Because the reality is, the less Canadian culture Black people have in Toronto, the closer they are to their country of origin, the better they seem to do. But 
Black communities aren't going anywhere. And the longer folks are here, the more we become disconnected from those countries of origin and this place becomes home. And because of that process, it's so critical that people see in this place spaces where Black folks can achieve anything they set their minds to, with flourishing businesses, cultural institutions, places of worship, community organization. It's so critical to the narrative. And yeah, we don't just need one space like that, it's many. But the fact is our historical Black spaces across the city are hurting and little Jamaica is hurting, both from the Eglinton Crosstown, but also decades of underinvestment and neglect. And so from that piece about why little Jamaica is so important, I think there's also some Easter eggs about what the new cultural district needs to look like. One of those pieces for me is that aesthetically and in the public realm, it needs to look nice. And that doesn't mean posh. That doesn't mean it's filled with a bunch of high-end Caribbean restaurants that local people can't eat at. But it does mean it needs to have well-maintained sidewalks and streetscapes. There needs to be in the investments in the maintenance of buildings. That mural on Reggae Lane is great, but we need even more incredible street art. We need nice amenities. Just the way when you go to Chinatown or Greek Town, you show up, it feels distinct from the rest of Toronto, but it feels flourishing, bustling, happening. That's the energy that's critical for this district. Where do we go then to get there, to get this place that truly shows the brilliance, the resilience, and the hard work of our community, a place to build that social capital and connection? Well, part of it has to do with the process for this cultural district. And, and I'll admit Cheryl is the expert around consultation and she's covered it well. I don't wanna repeat things, but maybe just a few points about consultation. And full disclosure, myself, and uh, my business partner, Zara Ibrahim, we're currently working with the city planning department around new tools for equity-centered engagement. But through that research, I kind of realized a few things about what's wrong with our consultations right now. And it's not all about people. Yes, we need more black planners and more black staff in city hall, no doubt. But there are many people we've met in the city who are doing this work, who understand the need to do consultation differently who understand the current system is flawed. It leads to most meetings, or many at least, being dominated primarily by white property owners over the age of 50. That resident associations and business groups, you know, development groups that are controlled by the wealthy and speak for property owners, they have disproportionate power in these processes. And staff have said, you know what, when we see equity in consultations, it usually happens because the individual in charge of it takes the initiative, not because it's required. And so one of the pieces that staff said is, we have to have equity targets for our consultations. It needs to be mandated. It has to be a requirement for the development of this district that we talk about the need to consult diverse groups and specifically vulnerable communities, folks who are not usually at the table. And that has to be a core goal when we launch these consultations. Another thing to think about is timing. Too often we have consultations, they mess up the timing. You know, they just follow what the legislation says, but it doesn't always make sense in the process. Many times you bring people in to consult when decisions have already been made, when their ideas can't really shape the process. And that's so frustrating for communities. And so we need to make sure the process engages early and throughout, and that we're honest to people about what's on the table and what decisions have already been made. And as Cheryl mentioned, the highest level of this, the ideal we need to you know, strive towards is a situation where residents have power. You know, example, Waterfront Toronto, they have this committee of outside experts who can look at any plans for development and they have kind of a veto and they're architects and planners and they can say because of aesthetics or architectural reasons, no, no, this plan needs to be changed. And I was talking about this with someone and they're like, why couldn't we have a group like that of residents that could sit there and also have a veto over plans who can look at plans that are developed for any place in this case, Little Jamaica Cultural District, and actually from a community perspective, say, no, 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 we, we need to stop this, we need to slow this down, we need to do it differently. And when we think about that, I'm talking about a group of residents who can be invested in, who can be paid to be part of this process, and can be there over time, so that that engagement is also about building civic literacy, helping people understand processes so they can continue to advocate for their communities. And the last piece to it about consultation is so often when we do these things, you go to Alaka and Nia Center for the Arts and you say, we need to do a consultation. Can you get 30 local residents in the room? That's fine to rely on these community-based groups, but we need to pay them properly. 
not a thousand dollar honorarium for their time or a little bit just like we RFP consultation and these big consulting and engagement companies get paid tens of thousands. The community groups that will be key to this process, they need to be properly compensated for their labor. Economics. We know that's a critical piece and that's the last thing I'll speak about. We know black communities have real disadvantages economically in Toronto. Black youth 18 to 24 have the highest rate of unemployment in the city. We know that the black community has the highest rate of working poverty of any community. And the most upsetting fact is that to this day, nearly 44% of black children in Toronto live in poverty, grow up in poverty. So economics is key. What does it look like? One part, entrepreneurship. And there's ideas, Cheryl's talked about this many times of having like a community commercial land trust where you could pool land and be able to give really accessible, affordable place for new businesses to stay in the community. That's part of it. Thinking about hubs and incubators for small businesses and communities so people don't have to go downtown for their supports. But real talk, entrepreneurship is hard. And I know it because I am one. You know, I run my own business. That's the main source of my family's income. And I know from doing community development work that entrepreneurship training is actually a horrible poverty reduction strategy. Why? Because so many people who start businesses, they fail. The majority fail. The majority of businesses in Canada take three years to turn a decent profit. It's a rigged game, entrepreneurship, that's really set up to benefit middle-class folks, folks who can live in mom and dad's basement for free while they're starting their business, who can get a loan from the bank of mom and dad, who can get introduced to suppliers and mentors from the folks that live on your street. All of that stuff matters to business success. And many times those are pieces that aren't available to folks of African descent. And so I'm not saying we don't need entrepreneurship. That is critical to this, but any community economic development strategy also needs to think about pathways to careers and jobs, especially for young people, giving people the training and the supports they need to succeed. So entrepreneurship is key, but so is workforce development. And so the community benefits that Rosemary talked about, that's a critical part of it. Having training that's on site within the community that's culturally relevant, whether it's in the trades or IT or different industries, that's critical, but also a strategy to attract major employers into the neighborhood. You know, and especially thinking about those major institutions that might be willing to work with communities and have many career options. So does that mean thinking about like a satellite campus from one of our post-secondary institutions or a new medical facility or some other type of employment zone? I don't know, but I think we need to build up what is in Eglinton now, primarily retail businesses, and then think of how we can expand that and also bring in more diverse employers ones that are black owned or black operated preferably, but all that have a specific vision of helping to provide career pathways for youth in the community, specifically youth of African descent. And then I think of, you know, we have all these foundations now that are coming together, whether it's Black Opportunities Fund or Black North, and they're trying to bring together capital to loan to uh, black businesses. You know, we need those groups, some of them to think about putting their headquarters in Little Jamaica. You know, all I can say is that black Torontonians face issues, but there's so much power in our communities, intellectual power, entrepreneurial skills, great networks of support and solidarity. And Northwest Toronto, this is the area with the highest concentration of Black Torontonians in the city. And so really this cultural zone can be an area that's an economic and cultural hub for that entire region of Toronto and the whole city. So just imagine Eglinton in 2040, where you can still go and get your wraps chicken late night after a fete, where you can still get your hair cut, but you can also visit a black run lending institution to do some banking and go see a show at the NIA Center. You can go to a business incubator to attend a session about connecting entrepreneurs in Canada with those in West Africa. You can walk by a long-term care facility for Caribbean seniors. We have none in the city right now, where you could volunteer at a cultural agency helping to mentor black youth and then end your day in a beautiful public space where you can chill outside, take in the vibes. Maybe there's steel pan being performed or people prepping for a block party. You know, that's part of my dream for this cultural district. And so the question for me, as we go into this new phase of Black history in Toronto, a phase which unlike eras past, will be determined as much by Canadian born Black folks as those coming from the diaspora. The question is how can those who live in this new era find a continued place for connection, 
solidarity, and inspiration in Little Jamaica, a place where people aren't worried about being displaced and pushed out, but can live, set down roots, and thrive. And I think this is the challenge that I hope the cultural district can be part of an answer to. Thank you. Wow, man, you did not disappoint. Thank you very much, um, Doc. Great job. And I'm sure the more than 100 of us that have been on this um, webinar today that we've been inspired greatly by your presentation and by all five panelists that have um, really laid out a really wonderful vision for us for Little Jamaica. Thank you all very much. And uh, we're now going to call on Josh Matlow, or city councillor for Toronto St. Paul Ward 12. He's the co-director of Earth Roots, a Toronto-based environmental non-governmental organization where he championed efforts to achieve protection legislation for the Oak Ridges Moraine and Ontario's Green Belt. That's where you made your name, sir. As St. Paul's school trustee from 2003 to 2010, he initiated a green grid project for renewable energy generators on school rooftops, homework policy reform, and advocated for governance and accountability reform, among others. As a community advocate and city councillor, Josh Matlow has fought for the protection and expansion of local parks and public space, high quality and affordable childcare, and um, evidence-based transit. Huh, boy, have we failed in that, right, uh, Councillor? <laughs> I, I cry with you many, many a night, including relief for the overcrowded subway system, support for local business areas, farmers markets, and arts and cultural events, revitalization of neighborhoods, an improvement of the official plan to put residents' quality of life before the interests of condo developers. Um, he's also advocated for action by the city and police to improve road safety and has championed and campaigned for solutions to gridlock and for governance reform at every level of government. Um, you know, Councillor Matlow has our back. He's been really instrumental at City Hall in pushing the Little Jamaica proje project. And we welcome you, sir, as our Thank respondent you. today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And what a, what a pleasure to see you, Royson, again. And, um, and thank you uh, to the City Institute at York and my wonderful friends at Budo and all of my esteemed panelists, fellow panelists, uh, many of you whom I've had uh, the privilege to work with uh, closely on some of the many things that have been referred to in the previous um, presentations. Um, so to begin with, I, um, I became the city councillor for part of the Little Jamaica area in 2019 when I was sworn in, but I was elected in late 2018 after Doug Ford messed around with our local elections and as you know cut the wards or cut the members of council in half and expanded the wards essentially twofold. So before that moment I had no idea that I would ever be the city councillor for this part of Edlington West. I knew it but I didn't know it well and for the first year of my term I spent time uh, listening, um, spending time with people, having coffees, um, slowly gaining a um, unhealthy dependence on Randy's patties, and just getting to know people. Um, I met Romaine and, and Dane and Cheryl, and some of the meetings and the events I, I started attending. Um, I'd go to these late night meetings with uh, Sipo Mapango, who is uh, a remarkable planner at the city, who's now working on the little Jamaica initiative. Um, and we would just sit there and listen um, and understand that there were advocates on the ground that were already working on supporting little Jamaica. And what we discussed was, what can we do as a city to support those community efforts? Um, 
And as we learned, and as we listened, I assembled a motion working with those grassroots efforts, along with bringing together an interdivisional, interdivisional team of city staff, meaning everyone from planning to economic development and culture, to the combating anti-Black racism unit, to many others, to pull together to create a holistic vision for what we can do as a city to support Little Jamaica. As we put together that motion, which ended up being this like massive omnibus of like 17 different items, looking at everything from uh, historic preservation, economic development and culture, tourism, uh, highlighting vibrant uh, African, Black, Caribbean arts and culture, uh, community engagement, looking at public realm, essentially looking at everything from as Kofi said, how do you how do you make sure that the streets are beautiful and the public realm is improved to protecting and supporting and celebrating the uh, the character and the identity of Little Jamaica? I mean, up until now, Little Jamaica actually hasn't even been formally known as Little Jamaica. It's been a colloquial uh, reference, unlike Chinatown, Little Italy and, and elsewhere in our city. Um, and it also became very apparent to me that um, as I listened and as I learned that there is a shameful history of racism in urban planning uh, here and throughout North America. And there has been a shameful history and trend wherever large infrastructure projects have been uh, constructed and where there have been development and gentrification pressures, black communities have typically been the first to be displaced. Little Jamaica has been facing both. North America's largest transit project right outside the business's front doors. And then due to that higher order of transit, which is a good thing, there comes development pressure, which if left unchecked, will be the developers putting their interests before those of the community. So the motion that I moved informed by the community members, including people who you see here today on the panel and in the audience, I believe, along with the city staff, set forward not all the answers, and I, I'm still not pretending that I know all the answers, I don't, but it posed the questions, it, it reflected the aspirations, it, it understood the upset and the frustration, and it identified the priorities that we need to look for answers for. And then we held a meeting, community meeting. It didn't go as well as I would have liked to see it uh, be done. Uh, too many talking heads from City Hall, not enough community interaction. So um, I worked with the community to bring forward another motion to focus on heritage designation, built form primarily, looking at a heritage conservation district along with the cultural district. And then we held another meeting as a community where I co-hosted with, uh, with Budo and it was more of a, like 90% of it was more just listening and focusing on priorities. It was interesting, um, Alika may like this, um, uh, a big priority was arts and culture. Uh, that was part of the feedback. We also heard that there was a big focus on a real interest in creating a hub, uh, uh, a health hub, both focusing on physical and mental health and there was a lot of interest in, along with supporting economic development, social development needed to be a priority as part of whatever plan we move forward with. Um, there was, I've talked to people who um, live in Ajax, Pickering, Mississauga, around the region, who tell me that they bring their kids to Eglinton because they want them to connect with their heritage, their identity. Uh, they wanna find a place to, touch. And they tell me that they miss the Kitty Carabana. Um, they feel that the area has deteriorated, that the Metrolinx project has an had an impact both on the business's well-being, but also on the streetscape. And they're saddened by where it's at, and they're worried about where it's going. Along with the local residential community, they share that concern. So this initiative is about looking to answer all the questions. Admittedly, the city has a limited toolbox when it comes to land use planning and when it comes to a number of these priorities. 
you know, unlike Oakland, and I believe, and uh, Carolyn, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Oakland, California is a charter city. What that means is that they have, constitutionally, they have the ability to have purview. They've got what is often, often called home rule over things like their finances, elections, wouldn't that be nice in Toronto? Um, land use planning. And while the state of California may have a say over, you know, what they can do about affordable housing or this or that, they have far more power on the ground to determine the destiny of how their neighborhoods are planned. Toronto doesn't have those powers because in Canada, constitutionally, cities aren't even referenced, never mind, they don't, they don't really exist. They are creatures of the province. And the challenge with that is that we need a friendly provincial government to provide us the tools that we don't have today to be able to achieve many of the goals that we want to uh, 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 aspire to uh, achieve, including uh, affordability for residential and affordability for commercial. Um, when it comes to uh, the question about supporting more black ownership over the buildings themselves, that's something that we strongly support. And I've spoken with uh, organizations like the Afro-Caribbean Business Network Foundation and others, um, along, with, along with others in the community, Kojo uh, Rekwanu Geb, who co-hosted the, uh, the meeting with Budo and myself. And there's a lot of ideas coming together about how the community can come together, whether it be start a non-for-profit, work with existing non-for-profits, uh, move forward with a land uh, trust cooperative concept that has been used successfully before in our city, including areas like Parkdale, looking at models here in Toronto and around the world and finding ways for that opportunity so that the, the Black, the Afro-Caribbean, the African diaspora communities can have actual control over the destiny of Little Jamaica. One of the things that I'm planning on doing, and if there's city staff on the line, sorry to surprise you. Uh, but we'll talk. Um, but I've discussed this with you before. I fundamentally believe that we need to incorporate an accountability table into this process, meaning that we've heard from a number of people on this panel and there are many other stakeholders, engaged residents, organizations, business leaders, black business uh, 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 owners who wanna be part of this conversation, wanna inform the conversation but also want to ensure that they're at the table, not just figuratively, but literally, so that before recommendations go forward to city council for the final report and throughout the process, that they're consulted, but they're also a filter. In other words, they can say, hey, we love where you're going with that. Or are you out of your minds? Why are you doing that? Or you, you gotta do better or you, you hit the nail on the head. But in other words, it's in our interest as a city to know that what we're doing will actually have a mandate for the very people who we purport to serve. And the principle of this initiative, I believe needs to continue to be that to, to Carolyn's point, how she's worked with the Black Cultural Zone in Oakland, which I was very inspired by, by the way, the, the city needs to be the vehicle, but the community needs to be the driver. And we should be there to help arrive at a place where little Jamaica has the supports it needs from government to be successful, that its identity and its character not only be preserved, but be celebrated and be promoted and invested in, that uh, as, as redevelopment occurs, that places like Raps and Randy's and the barbershops that aren't just barbershops, but they're like quasi community centers, that they are able to survive and grow. And if they're gonna, if there's a new building, they, they have ability to come back in. Um, the streetscape needs to be improved. You know, there's a reference to Reggae Lane and, you know, I've become friends with Jay Douglas and, you know, he loves the murals. We all love the murals. It was a good project, but it was an incomplete project. It's a beautiful mural in a really awful lane. And if we're to be honest, and that's why we're working with people like Lori Beezer to not just wait for the long-term vision, but to bring a farmer's market. I was telling Royson about this earlier, um, a farmer's market on the 4th of July, it's gonna open. And it's gonna be a farmer's market right at the Green Pea 
um, near Oakwood on the south side of Eglinton, which will both be an Afro-Caribbean market for the community, but also animate the space, make it safer, make it more lively, make it fun, make it something that we can be proud of. I'm talking to somebody else, by the way, and I worked with York Eglinton BIA on that too, and I wanna thank them for their partnership. Um, we're talking to another woman who wants to bring a, uh, uh, a Caribbean food festival to the area. So yes, we, we, you know, everyone wishes that the Kitty Carnival, the Kitty Caravana didn't go to Malvern, but whether or not something like that returns, we can contribute new ideas with, uh, with more, you know, with more people who want to contribute to the vision of what Little Jamaica should have been and can be if we and they do it right. So I'll conclude on this. I believe that this needs to be a collaborative, inclusive effort. This needs to be done through the lens of urban planning, through anti-Black racism, through city building, through supporting small businesses. And if anyone ever asks, what is the definition in Toronto of a cultural district? I think the honest answer is that we don't know yet that we understand that this is important, but the actual definition will be informed by the result of the work that we do over the next year, and then approve whatever recommend recommendations come forward from this interdivisional team from the city um, in consultation, informed by and worked with, worked on with the community next year. And then we will know what it is. What we aspire it to be is one that, again, improves the public realm, helps keep the businesses alive and successful, retains and celebrates the Black, Caribbean, and African diaspora character and identity of Little Jamaica, understands that if we name it Little Jamaica, it also includes the Bayesians and everybody else who calls this area home or loves it and cares about it. And ultimately, that we just don't paint it and do a few things and then celebrate a museum. But one day we look back at this legacy project and recognize that we did something truly revolutionary and something that perhaps other cities will come to us and then maybe we'll go to their webinars and, and maybe they can learn from what we've done. And that, that's what I hope it becomes. But um, you know, lastly, I wanna thank uh, people like Romaine and Dane and Anika and Cheryl and everybody else who's inspired me and inspired us because their work was already happening and now we need to be the vehicle to help drive this home. Thank you. I think you're still on mute, Rosa. Wonderful, thank you, yeah, appreciate that. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Matlow. Uh, we got, we're running out of time people, but we have some questions. So why don't we just jump right in, right? The first question, um, from Rory Cohen. Has there been thought given to collaborations that could assist Black people purchasing homes in Little Jamaica? For example, collaborations with banks for preferred loans and organizations like Habitat for Humanity for Black developers and realtors, etc. And I, I guess in addition to the purchasing homes is um, making sure rents are affordable, right? So, um, and who would like to jump in on that, um, that particular question? Um, I, I can give uh, the first go. So in the Black Futures of Edmonton report, one of the recommendations is to su support for Black developers to build affordable housing for the Black community. Um, so that's one thing that we are pursuing as part of um, the community work. Um, and you know, we actually have a, a project that we're kind of exploring at the moment that that might hopefully implement that action. Um, and then also we have the Tenant Solidarity Program, which is named Tenant Solidarity Program because conventionally planning excludes tenants from the conversation. They're not really engaged, their, their interests aren't reflected. Um, and so this, this project is about building solidarity with tenants and homeowners to achieve affordable housing. And so at the moment we're um, in the process of, uh, we just launched our affordable housing working group to the community this uh, Monday. And so we're uh, hopefully by October, we'll be having a some kind of a workshop that really uh, sort of defines our targets 
um, which would be, of course, building affordable housing and, and things like that. Um, and so I do know that uh, there are higher level programs that are coming about at CMHC or that they're thinking about on these topics, but that's what's happening at least at the ground level at the moment through the work that I'm involved in. So. I, can, I can just add on to Cheryl's comments that um, the city council has been advocating for years that the province um, allow us the ability to not just negotiate or beg developers to allocate a certain percentage of affordable units on new buildings that are built, but actually provide us what's called inclusionary zoning so that we can just say, if you want that approved through council, you have to give us a certain percentage. Um, the province finally said yes, but a limited yes. So in other words, it's not gonna be everywhere, but it will be within five to 800 meters surrounding major transit stations, which we are getting along Eglinton. So the details are yet to come, but what we're gonna be looking at closely is exactly how that caramel formula will work as far as exactly what percentage we'll be able to obtain uh, residential wise. And then the other discussion that I think is important to have with the province is the is to provide the ability for the city to also work with uh, uh, business owners to um, uh, to ensure that there is affordable commercial rent uh, on the ground as well. Okay. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Okay. I mean, I, I think that the heart of Rory's question is: Are there you know tools out there? to actually reduce the price of housing or provide people with the type of um, financial assistance to bring housing within their range so that they can actually live in that, in that, in that particular neighborhood. Um, I don't know if there are any, yeah. I think a, a Black Cultural Zone, California, uh, Oakland provides some great examples as to how you actually accomplish that. So, you know, just, you know, zoom back in your memory to what, what she said. That's exactly the thing that we need to be doing here in Toronto and Little Jamaica. Um, we're not, we're not there yet, but I think we are on our way. Okay. And I guess the question is, are those tools actually available to us, right? In, <laughs> in Canada. All right. Next, next question then. How can we discuss the cultural importance of Little Jamaica without exploiting it to make money? <laughs> right? Because when we talk about um, cultural destination or world-class city, we're really describing cities that have exploited its artists and diversity for money. And this, this person is a bit concerned about discussing the cultural unique, culturally unique neighborhoods and or other ethnically diverse neighborhoods purely in terms of how its cultural uniqueness can bring revenue into the neighborhood. So they're asking what else constitutes a wealthy, healthy neighborhood other than money? Who's a smart person? Maybe the Rhodes Scholar can uh, jump. <laughs> this is a, um, a serious question here. Yeah, yeah. So as far as that piece about what can, you know, what kind of neighborhood are we thinking about? And I, I would agree. I think health has to be at the forefront of that, right? When we think right. about, it's not about <laughs> the GDP per square mile or about, you know, the wealth that gets invested into new buildings. It has to be driven first and foremost, by, by the social determinants of health and the health of the residents that are there. Um, and, and though it's interesting when you think about a destination, right, that concept, because the neighborhood is a destination for Black folks all across the GTA already. And I think that's something we want to build on is important. And, and not just Black folks, many people go for the food and the culture that's there. So it, it's not... I think it's true. We don't want to be transforming this into a place where people come to just consume Black culture and where it is, um, you know, for show and local folks, as, as I mentioned before in my talk, local folks can't even afford to eat there anymore or go out. Right. That's not right. the direction we want to go into. And I think, you know, we have to think there's a balancing act. I think one is a goal has to be set around health. Um, 
We also need to think about things like these commercial land trusts that allow there to be economic development, but at the same time, um, you know, and Cheryl, when we, and her and I actually were talking to the article, she talked about this, you know, as rents go up, then the prices of products have to go out and people can get priced out. And so things like commercial land trusts, by keeping the land low, can allow the price of goods to still be accessible to local folks in community. Um, and I think also when you think about land trusts as far as housing, that's another way that you can, you know, collectively buy properties and keep the rents at an affordable rate. It, I don't think there's one answer because it's true. As you see areas become in demand, people are going to want to move there. People are going to want to come there. And how you balance that in a way that brings the growth that people need. Like if you talk to the businesses on Eglinton now, they'd say, yeah, we'd like to be a destination because we've been killed for the last few years by the LRT and all these other pieces. Right. And so I, I think it's about really thoughtful planning, articulating what the goals are in community. And then these interventions that allow the cost of living and the cost of having a business in the community to remain affordable for folks. Um, yeah, and, and I'd be very interested in finding out, you know, where is that being done? Because that's, that's, that's the crux right there. So difficult once the place become, <laughs> you know, gentrified and it's a place to go and it's, it's the happening place, then people are just squeezed out. All right, let me, let me jump to the next question. Is there a black... Business BIA for Little Jamaica. Oh yeah, the question. I remember the first time I heard about uh, the issues with the BIA, I thought, oh yeah, well, it's the owners of Randy's and the barbershop and thinking that um, they actually own the properties. Um, so that may not be the case here. So is there a black BIA and could we engage to, and what, oh, is there a black, BIA for Little Jamaica that we could engage with, I guess, in developing this, this, this project. Councillor, I guess you know um, yeah. a, a lot about the, the BIA that's there and who actually constitute the BIA. Yeah. Um, he sighs me, before he speaks. Pardon me? I <laughs> say so you're sighing before you speak. <laughs> Yeah, because it's complex and it's controversial. Um, it, um, but I'll be candid. Um, the uh, what I was hearing, um, what I was hearing from a lot of people who I was, who I, who I refer to, who I was listening to uh, when I first became counselor, is that there was upset that the BIA wasn't um, wasn't reflective. Uh, well, of the uh, black businesses, that it was virtually all white people in the leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact, that's true. And there was upset and frustration and concern by many uh, members of the community that uh, the BIA was not uh, focusing on the priorities of black businesses, business owners. Uh, the, you know, the, the logo on the street signs say something like international marketplace, which I think means Virtually nothing to no one, um, and um, and there wasn't there there wasn't a trust uh, a relationship of trust there uh, to move forward together. Um, I must say, in fairness to the BIA, um, uh, the leadership of the BIA has embraced the Little Jamaica initiative. They have put out their hand um, in partnership. They have been doing real things, including the partnership that they demonstrated to work with me and Lori on uh, the Afro-Caribbean farmer's market, Lori's uh, farmer's market. And they've been, they've been a good partner. Um, what I believe is gonna be important though, is that there will have to be, um, there will have to be a, a better, I believe a better reflection of the community and the diversity of the community at the leadership of the BIA. And that hasn't happened. Um, so that relationship, I think is getting better. I think the relationship is moving in the right direction, but there's going to have to be some real changes to make sure that um, Little Jamaica has representation. The businesses have representation from uh, from from people who uh, reflect uh, the 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 Caribbean and Black community in Little Jamaica. And I think that's going to be a priority. 
Yes, listen, thank you guys all, all very much. This is very enlightening. I know I feel a lot better going out of this than, than coming in. It, it's, it's inspiring and wonderful to know that, you know, the city, a city councilor, um, all our great minds, are seized with this and are about to give little Jamaica the opportunity and the chance to, to take flight. And I encourage all the people who attended today's webinar to um, engage, read the, the reading material that's been put in the chat so that you can expand your knowledge about this. And um, really appreciate it and thank you to all our guests, Cheryl Case, Alika Hall, Rosemary Powell, Carolyn Johnson, and Kofi Hope. Thank you guys very much. And I'm going to, going to turn it over to uh, Professor William Jenkins from the City Institute Interim Director and Romaine Baker for the closing remarks. Um, we've had an enlightening evening, uh, an inspiring evening, and uh, we could go on obviously for another half an hour, um, but I think we've learned a lot. Um, where Little Jamaica is concerned, we've learned a lot about the forces and the role of economy, culture, coalition building, solidarity building, um, the nature of consulting and what it really means, who is at the table um, and what can they do. Uh, we've learned a little bit towards the end about the, the political architecture of Canada itself and its limitations for, for cities and, and not just a city, but a, but a metropolis, um, really. Um, we've learned a lot about the role of the imagination, uh, not just in terms of the, the, the future of, of black spaces, but also um, the, the wider uh, dismant for the wider dismantling of stereotypes that produce um, disadvantage. Um, we'll be sure to notify everybody of when this recording will be available on our YouTube channel. We estimate, you know, within the next week, it'll be available for you to watch and rewatch and we learn. Um, I'd like to re reiterate thanks to the panelists, Cheryl, Alika, um, Carolyn, Kofi, and Rosemary, to Mr. James, our moderator, uh, Councillor Matlow, um, my colleague, Professor Squire, uh, the City Institute Coordinator, Hazel Dizon, and of course, um, Romain uh, and Dane and Ruth of uh, Black Arisen Toronto for uh, um, helping to make this evening happen after. Um, a considerable number of, of meetings and emails, uh, all very productive, all uh, positive, uh, and uh, we're really glad that this, this happened, um, and we hope it's useful for everybody. Uh, thanks also to Professor Andrea Davis and her committee at York University who allocated funds through the Anti-Black Racism Initiatives Fund, and to all of you out there who care about enhancing the lives of people and places, um, good luck to you all in your work. Um, thank you for being here with us, and I hope you feel fired up by what you've heard this evening. So I will leave it to uh, Remain to say a few more words and wish you all a great evening. Thank you, William. <clears throat> um, I just want to thank each of the five panelists for for sharing your expertise with us tonight, um, for the time that you you spent to to prepare your presentations and to really hold space um, with us. I think. This was such an inspiring conversation. Um, and it was just to, to me, what kept resonating with me and like coming to my mind was just how powerful <laughs> we are, how smart we are, how there's absolutely, um, you know, with, with, with the level of, of expertise that, that we see here um, among the panelists and, you know, on the ground with all of us that are working to ensure that this that this this cultural district is done well that you know there's really nothing um, stopping us um, in our ability to do that it takes dedication it takes diligence and perseverance but we we are definitely powerful and that was definitely um, demonstrated tonight um, I'd also like to thank um, you know William and the the City Institute for for providing this platform and for allowing us the the creative license to to really think through you know um, the outcomes of uh, a webinar like this and how it can contribute to this process that we're currently going through, you know, as this, the consultation um, period is 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 going to be kicking off for this cultural district, 
and we really wanted to ensure that, you know, as community and people who are committed to this work, that we can also build our capacity, that we can, you know, um, look at this from other perspectives and hear from experts to inform our idea, our ideas of, you know, how this cultural district can come to can come to life, and also for, you know, city staff and those who are developing, you know plans and preparing to consult with community that uh, they too will have the opportunity to you know to think broader and holistically um and so that we can be prepared to give very meaningful direction once you know we have that opportunity to um to have our voice heard um i want to thank the 60 people participants that are that you know that are hanging out and are still on the line tonight the the attendance hovered around 100 um throughout this for most of tonight. And I think it's, that's just a testament of how important this, this period of time is in Toronto's history and for this neighborhood. Um, there, there's, you know, so much, um, there's a huge legacy that, and we have to give, you know, homage and respect to the people whose shoulders we're, we're standing on. And, you know, the, we, we, we owe them this to ensure that their, their legacy continues to be a part of Toronto's story. And, you know, the presentations are just so powerful and you know to you know one of the points that that, that kofi um shared about you know the third generation you know that third generation not being able to it's like the furthest removed from you know our, our homes back home wherever that may be but still not being able to uh, you know reach those those outcomes um economically and socially like their parents and those who came before them that is definitely very very concerning something that all of us should be concerned about and so you know little jamaica needs to be transformative for for black and really all communities are going to be benefiting um, from a thriving um, cultural district that that centers canada's black um presence right so I'm, I'm truly inspired and I hope you're all inspired as well and that this can give us that, you know, that added level of, 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 of vision that we need to continue this work. Um, on behalf of uh, my team, Black Urbanism TO, I want to thank each and every one of you again. And um, can't really see my shirt, but we got to represent the logo. All right, thank you all. I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Royce and James. Oh, and I want to thank the Honorable Royce and James, and I'm going to give you that that that, that honor. I, I listen to you quite frequently on Sundays on G98, so it was good to see you, um, see your face. In the flesh, In the flesh right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Listen, thank you guys very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it, everyone, and thank you for joining in. And um, you'll be able to watch this very soon, so um, watch for it. And to all our panelists from here to California. Thank you very much and good night. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Councillor Matlow, for